We, uh, we've been looking in Colossians, and we are halfway through the book. Gee whiz, oh wow. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I think this is, now that I've, I've put so much time studying into this book, I think that this actually might be one of my favorite of Paul's uh, writings. It was one of those books that I kind of just, mm, whatever, you know, and, and then once I just started studying, I was like, oh, okay, all right. So we've looked at the introduction. That was chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Uh, we looked at theology. We finished that. And that's basically, you, you know, what are your beliefs? What do you, what, what you believe? That's it. Everybody has a theology. An atheist has a theology. Everybody has a theology. A theology is just what you believe. So uh, about God specifically, theos is God, so the study of God. Um, an atheist would say that their theology is that God doesn't exist. So that would be their theology. Um, sometimes there's a disconnect between what we believe and what we kind of put into action. Um, and I talked about this last year. We were talking about the difference between believing God and believing in God. You know, that's the difference between head knowledge and uh, heart action, I guess you could say. Uh, and so now that takes us to the third and final section of the book, um, and that's just ethics. Ethics is, is a fancy word for basically how you live, how to live. It's your, your lifestyle. Um, another way of saying it is how to live what you believe. Sometimes there's a disconnect between what we believe or what we say we believe and, uh, you know, how we choose to live from that. And, uh, okay. So, uh, any questions on that? No? Uh, I have put the ending of the, of the letter um, in with that ethics section. So, um, if you read in the end of chapter 4 there, like verse 15, for instance, it's not going to really actually talk about ethics at all. So, um, as I was studying through Colossians, I noticed that there are some things that Paul typically does to um, combat the heresy. And a heresy, what heresy means is it's a false uh, belief, basically. And so how did, what, what did Paul go to to answer the heresy? How did he know that something was heresy, and what, what did he do to, to show that it was a heresy? Any, any ideas? Scriptures, yes. Anything else? I've listed, I think, four, maybe five. Let's see. It'll be a surprise for both of us. The first one uh, that, that Paul frequently leans on, and I'm not just talking about Colossians. We're talking about in Romans, uh, Philippians, um, obviously Colossians. The first thing that he does whenever he's looking at a belief to see if it is a heresy or not is he looks at the product of the belief. What is the outcome of it? Like, what, what is produced by it? Uh, there are some people who believe that Jesus was not fully God. Okay, so he was only able to do those things through um, that he did when he was here on earth through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The conclusion of that belief, the product of that belief, is that therefore I can also attain his same level or even greater than he did on earth um, through the Holy Spirit working through me. See, that would be the product of the belief. The product of the belief is I have become arrogant in my own eyes. I think that I am a source of power. I think that I am as great as God. See, that would be the product of the belief. What is the outcome of the belief? Um, and, and I also want to point out the fact that a lot of times people say that they believe something, but they don't really believe it. You'll find out what you really believe when you go through times of difficulty. Oh, I believe that God's good and he, he, he cares and all this. Okay, so then you have one after another problem comes up. You get health problems. You get everything and your family starts falling apart. Is God still good? Like, or did it change? Now, typically what happens is we have a little bit of an inner struggle, and we realize, oh, God's not that good. He doesn't even care. You know, and then, you know, we grow, and, and we go through that struggle, and we get to, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, he, he does still care. Or we just leave the faith. Typically, though, you're not going to just stay at the same spot. You're either going to go forward, or you're just going to kind of crack, crack in on yourself. Um, so then the second thing that, that, that Paul oftentimes uh, goes to to look at his to, to look at heresy is what does scripture say about this? So you know, for instance, okay, well, I, I think that it's okay for me to date a woman who is not a Christian. Okay, what does the Bible say about that? So that's how Paul would that's how Paul would take that and, and look at it. The third thing that he does is he relies strongly on I, I just kind of put these into one category, but it's kind of two different things. So I'll kind of say them separately. The cohesion of this belief with the heretical belief with earlier teachings. 
So if you look at Christian history, there, there's a lot of continuity in the belief. A lot of, you know, it, it really didn't change. I mean, there were things in cults that kind of got going, and there was extremism that formed. You see this with uh, the Catholic Church, you know, with the whole Pope thing going on. Uh, but the, by and large, the main core message of Christianity has stayed the same, and there's been a great continuity with it. And uh, th that's one of the things that Paul really depends on. He talks about leadership of the church. Hey, follow the example that I have set. He says that actually quite frequently. Um, or he'll say, you know, as was handed down to you. He's talking about the continuity of belief, the way that it didn't change. Uh, so is the belief that is being taught, excuse me, it, the belief that's being taught, is it, does it match up with previous uh, teachings? <coughs> So in, uh, in Mormonism, they have this thing where they have these holy underwear. And, uh, you know, so this would be a good example of a man-made ordinance, right? There, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us to do this, but it would be a good example of a man-made doctrine. And um, we can look at that man-made doctrine and say, does it conform with earlier teachings about holy underwear anywhere in the Bible? And we can say, no, no, it doesn't. Um, there's a lot of different ideas about what happens in the next life. Like some, for so, so for a lot of cults, we become some sort of a god um, at various levels. But I mean, if you really just take it apart, that's kind of what it ends up as. And so, is the fa is the idea of us becoming gods is that co cohesive with earlier teachings? And so we can look at church history, not the scripture, not the Bible, church history, and we can say no, that really doesn't doesn't fit. And that's why a lot of cults say. Well, the truth was hidden and lost for countless generations, and it was restored to us in, you know, these latter days. A lot of cults do that. And the reason for that is because church history doesn't agree with what they're saying. So along with this whole idea of earlier teachings, you could also say, what is Christ's example? <clears throat> what is the example that Christ left us? Well, you know, I think it's okay to, you know, to, to do ministry for yourself and just kind of, you know, Focus on you. Well, it does, it does, that, does that match up with the example that Christ left us? And so by doing that, you can say, okay, well, now I know if this is heresy or not. And this is what Paul did. So the last thing, that the last of the four, and I was right, it was four, has a has, high five. Uh, now, the last thing that Paul depends on is the foundation of the belief, the motivation of the belief. Um, what's another way I could say that? Uh, what spawned the belief? You know, like, so for instance, the, the, there's a sentiment that goes, goes around quite frequently um, in our culture. You are worthy. Okay, well, what's the motivation of that statement? See what I mean? And that kind of, so, so let me give you an example, and this might help you to kind of see what I'm talking about, about how, how Paul was able to distinguish that it was a, a, a heresy. Because nowadays people say, hey, that, that's true for you, it's not true for me. But Paul talked authoritatively that there was a truth and that there were heresies that were not true. So if there is an absolute truth, and truth is not just something that I decided to be, and Paul was able to discern it by looking at those four things, we too can discern whether we are believing in, in her heretical th things. So here's, here's a good example from modern days. There's this idea going on that people at their core are basically good. Okay, so that's... That's my preliminary, that, that's the foundation of my, of my belief. And then, well, I know that God is love. So I've taken a scripture that backs up my view. Okay, now, now that I have this as my foundation, now I'm going to go to, therefore, we don't have to be concerned about punishment, about God punishing people. We, we don't have to be afraid of that. Everybody's going to be saved. And I know that because people are basically good, and so if God's a really good God, why would he punish a bunch of, bunch of you know, good people? You know, like my grandma. My grandma's a really good person. And then you would say, okay, and then God is love, so I know that if you really love somebody, you'll give them everything that they want. So then I now have a good foundation, and, and this is how I live my life too. When my kids ask for something, I just instantly say yes because I love them, therefore I must have no uh, responsibility with, with giving or anything like that. It's just, oh, I love them, so I have to give them whatever they want. So now I'm able to go to the next next step. So if there is no punishment, I have to follow my heart, and I have to live by by my own standards and, you know, kind of let my own arrow guide me, and that way I can, I can really find my core in life. 
which is all, what a lot of people use for their entire argument for what's called social justice warrior. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but it's basically whatever the culture tells you is the hot topic of the day, you have to have the exact same very strong opinion and you have to be very rude about it. So it doesn't matter if we're talking about you know, race or feminism or woke ideology or politics. It does not matter what we're talking about. At the end of the day, people are good. God is love. So we have to stay and we have to hold the standard of being good, loving people because that's who we are at our core. See what I mean? So that's a good example of how, how it kind of just spirals out of control. And so Paul used those four checks to see if something was heretical. And so now that we've looked at that, we can move on to his next section, with his, which is where he's talking about the ethics. It's going to go through chapter 3 and chapter 4. And the first subsection, subsection we're going to look at is just four verses long. And it, it could just be summarized as think holy. Control your thinking. Uh, he also talks about this in Philippians. I'll look at that at the very end. Let's move on. So this is how, this is how the last part from a month ago ended. Uh, if you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? And remember, he's talking about the way that there's some people who think that they have to do the right things. They have to fulfill the rituals in order to be fully saved. So I have to, you know, basically be a little bit Jewish to be saved. I have to still follow the Sabbath or the cleansings or the different, you know, all the different fill in the blanks. And if I do enough of those good things, it will bring my salvation to fruition or to its conclusion or whatever. Uh, and then it says here in verse 22, all these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. So then that takes us to uh, the last verse of chapter 2, and he says this, although these have a reputation for wisdom, like fasting, that sounds really holy, especially for monks. You know, we know that monks go up on the mountains. They get away from everybody. They don't eat food. Okay, this sounds like a good, holy, righteous thing to do. And so it has a, a, a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body. They are not of any actual value in curbing self-indulgence. So, like, for instance, I fast to show how holy I am, but then when I'm done with my fast, I scarf down as much as I can possibly scarf down. So it didn't actually help me do anything to curb my self-indulgence. It just made me feel better and more superior over somebody else for a time. And I'm not saying you shouldn't fast. I'm just saying it really doesn't matter why you do something. Uh, a lot of times more so than that you do it. So uh, that takes us to Colossians 3. So that leads right into Colossians 3. So if you have been raised with Christ, which is what we just looked at in chapter 2, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Then he goes on in verse um, 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This sounds really super confusing, but it's really super easy. So Paul switches. I don't know if you noticed this, but he switches what he's talking about from talking about the failure of the rituals to save you. So now he swings way over to the other side and he starts talking about the failure of lawlessness. You can't just, you know, hey, you guys are trying to do rituals to be saved. And then you go, okay, and by the way, you other people are living like there are no boundaries. You can just live however you want. And, uh, and, and that brings up a very interesting problem. If rituals, you know, like the fastings and the observing the Sabbath and all those you know, the, uh, following the Passover and all that stuff, if, if those rituals don't bring us to salvation, surely our lifestyle doesn't really matter at all. And if you look at um, Colossians 2, 20 through 21, out of context, it kind of seems to imply that. And in fact, I've, I've talked about a lot, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who do this. They take this verse and say, therefore, I can live free, which basically means lawless. I can just do whatever I want or whatever I feel like. And uh, that's kind of just how I decide my, my morals of what is right and wrong. If you died with Christ to the elements, so forget everything we've looked at in Colossians. Throw it all away. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you, um, as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? See, it's not wrong for me to be a drunk, for me to be a druggie, for me to be looking at porn, for me to you know, cheat on my wife, because I'm free from the law. Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. I'm not submitting to those regulations anymore. See, out of context, it kind of sounds like that's what Paul is saying. But 
That's why I went to such great lengths to show you all that Paul is trying to say to show you in context what he's actually saying. So now, now we can go to this. Rituals, see, there's this idea that rituals are over here, ritual observance, doing all the right things. And over here is lawlessness, living by your own standards. But that's not actually true. See, rituals are man-made. They're not heavenly. We follow rituals that we create ourselves. I mean, even if you look at the Old Testament law, nothing in the Old Testament law is really that new. There were the dietary restrictions, right, in, in the law, in like the book of uh, Leviticus or somewhere around there, and it talks about how they couldn't eat certain things like pork. Well, that wasn't new, actually. The, the ancient Near East, they, they had lots of their own dietary stipulations for their laws. That wasn't new. The whole temple and how it had the three different parts to it, that wasn't new. That was something that was observed in the, in the Middle East long before the law was ever given to Moses. The whole law being claimed, a, a, a law that was supposedly given by God. Again, this is not a new concept. This is something that God repurposed all these ideas. None of it was new or original. He repurposed things that the people already held to. The whole, the whole thing with the circumcision, everybody knows that that's a Jewish thing, right? Wrong. <laughs> Before the Jews ever did the circumcision, that was the thing that people did. God repurposed the circumcision to show them towards Jesus, to point them towards Jesus. That was it. Like, it wasn't something that the law didn't show morality, okay? The law showed our lack of morality. It showed our sinfulness. It didn't reveal morality in it. By setting aside the law, we don't set aside morals. Like, God is the source of morals, not the law. Morals existed before the law, and they existed after the law. A lot of times, we go to the law as though we're still trying to observe it and still trying to follow it, and we don't really know really a whole lot about it. So we say, well, I'm going to observe some of it, like the Ten Commandments. And then I'm going to just ignore the other part of it, like the whole clipping the sides of your beard thing. And that's not really how it goes. The law in its entirety is fulfilled in Christ. So then what purpose does the law even have for us today? Anybody? It's a teacher. Okay. Anything else? I, I didn't catch Guidelines, yeah. One thing is it shows us the heart of God. And another thing is the New Testament assumes that you already know about the Old Testament. So did you notice how many times Jesus said, hey, homosexuality is bad? Never once. Do you know why? Because they already had the law. <laughs> there was no reason to reiterate it. He's assuming that you already know about the law. So now that we can say that, we can go back to this and say, okay, so we know that rituals and lawlessness are not two extremes. They aren't two, two things. They're both man-made, and they're not heavenly. Both of them are not opposites. They are extremes, extremes of a human philosophy. Lawlessness is I am God. Rituals are I can control God. Either way, it's not opposites. They're just an extreme of a false view of God. And that's really what Paul's trying to get at here. So the, the common thread running through this that Paul's trying to emphasize here is that rituals are not heavenly and lawlessness is not heavenly. See, because the church was really divided down the middle. There were some people thinking that we have to be Jews to be saved, and other people thinking, I can live however I want because I'm saved in spirit. Jesus was spirit, and I also am spirit, so I'm saved in spirit. So the physical doesn't really matter that much. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. So, okay, let's let's tie some ideas here in here before we actually look at the verses. First off, Christ is God, so we are saved by faith. We have faith in God's grace. Um, I'm not ready to go to that yet. I thought I had this on a different side. I do not have it on a different side. Um, okay, so G Jesus is, is, is fully God, so we are saved by, by faith. We, we, we have faith in his grace that he's given us, right? Saved by grace through faith. Okay, all right. So that means Jesus was not just a good person, okay? We're not talking about a good person, because if Jesus was a good person, remember, basically anybody could get to heaven on their own. We didn't need a good person. We need, some, we need somebody who is perfect. Well, the only one who is perfect is God. So entra Jesus, and he is, you know, he's exactly what we're looking for. He's, he's 
God. So we are saved by our faith in what he has done. He has died in our place. Okay, so that takes us to the next idea here. But Jesus was also fully human. And what that means is that he set an example for us. So we obey him with our lifestyle. See, because he was God, not just a good person, we have faith in him. Because he was a human, he set the example for us on how to live. For instance, this blows a lot of people away. Jesus, when he was here on the earth, he submitted himself and followed to the Israelite Jewish law. He lived by the law. He did not break the law. And that's because the law was still in effect. He was only able to cast aside the law as he fulfilled the law, not only in its intent, but in its standards. So when he fulfilled it, he set it aside. We're no, we no longer have to go through, the, go through the law. We go through Christ now. So these are some really big things that are happening here. So just because we don't, just because we don't have to live by man-made rituals, the washings and all that stuff, the sacrifices, all, all that stuff, doesn't mean we can live however. It doesn't mean that. We are saved by God's grace through our faith. And the evidence that we have been saved, James is going to clarify right here, the evidence that we have been saved is uh, we have two, two, two things that, that come whenever we are truly saved. The first is works. Works come when we are saved. And, and the second thing that comes is holy living. Okay? Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. This is in James 1, 127. Uh, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, that would be works, good works. He's not saying only to do this thing. He's talking about works in general, good works. Okay? Uh, widows and orphans were kind of the outcasts of society. People didn't really care for them. So by mentioning them, he's talking about the lowest of society, the people that are most uncared for. Make sense? So it's kind of a stand-in for good, doing good works. Okay? Uh, widow, orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So that would be the holiness thing. And I believe I have a, a slide here. No, I do not. Uh, later on, I have a slide that kind of just defines what holiness is. So we are, sa we are saved not by our goodness, not by our, how holy we are. We're saved by our, our faith in, in, in God. And as that bears fruit, the fruit of that is that we live holy, right? We don't sleep around anymore, right? Uh, but then also we do works. Maybe we uh, serve at the food pantry or something, okay? So now we can move on to the verses that we actually read and really it's not it's not as complicated and I even have a slide at the end to just kind of summarize everything that that we look at in these verses so if you have been raised with Christ which we have according to chapter 2 remember we are baptized we go down to symbolize our death with him and then we're raised up we're we're raised to new life uh, after we after the salvation process and I, I talked about the way that Paul talks about baptism as a title for getting saved because when you got saved you got baptized so they were kind of knit together so he's talking about the way that baptism, okay, go down, come back up. Okay, but we're looking forward to the resurrection, right? We're looking forward to the new body, the, the new life, all that stuff. No aches, no pains, no, no bad things. <laughs> Good things in heaven, right? We're looking forward to that. So if we have been raised with Christ, we haven't realized the full being raised, but okay. Seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So seek the things above. And that's kind of what I want to, want to point out here. He says, so if you have been raised with Christ, we don't have to live by the rules, all the, the rituals and rules that the Jews were trying to make Christians follow because we have died and been raised with him. When we got saved, we died to our flesh. So we are no longer living for ourselves. And so because we died with Christ by accepting him, the us died, that also means that we were given new life. We haven't seen the, seen the full reality of that, but we have been given that full life. So we have been raised with Christ. So we don't have to follow rituals as a dead person does to try and earn salvation because we've already been raised with Christ. He was raised and taken to heaven. This is what it's talking about here. Seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So we're seeking things above where Christ is.
So he was raised and taken to heaven. We were raised and will be taken too. See, we were raised in new life here on earth, but this isn't, this isn't the end of the story. When we get to heaven, there's going to be, you know, the resurrected body will be taken up into heaven, and uh, we will also experience that second life um, that we're obviously looking forward to. Um, so his idea here is we, we need to be seeking the eternal or the heavenly things. So a good example of this would be just a real quick side-by-side. -side. A good example of seeking earthly things would be money. Seeking eternal things would be, um, you know, uh, God's kingdom. So seeking to get people saved. Seeking to invest your life in a way that, you know, makes an impact on, on, on God's kingdom. You know, um, giving to missionaries. These kinds of things would be building up heavenly wealth. We're, we're looking at the eternal. It's Think of it like this. You're looking at your life. And people who don't know Christ, they look at their life as, I have this much time to party and enjoy my life as much as I want because I only live once. Christians look at this and we say, we have such a limited time before we get to heaven. You know, this is a very short time, so I have to invest it very wisely. See, because we're looking at, we're looking at what's coming. So it takes us to verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Okay, that, that makes pretty good sense. Did I forget to take it off that last one? No, I didn't. Okay, good. Set your minds on, on things above, not on earthly things. So earthly things, let's, let's go through some examples of what are earthly things. Uh, pleasures. If I'm, you know, um, doing things that are all about me, making my life all about me. Maybe it's, maybe it's going to a whorehouse. Maybe it's looking at porn. Uh, maybe it's uh, doing drugs. I mean, really, whatever it is, that, that just a pleasure-seeking lifestyle. If you've ever been in that, which I kind of have a strong feeling that everybody who's ever lived has, uh, if you've ever been in that, you know that it's just kind of like, you could say that the desires of, uh, the temporary fleeting desires of life. I and mean, when you're a kid, especially guys, they, they think they think of having as many women as possible because there's always one more woman out there that's hotter than the last. So they see it as almost like a game, you know what I mean? It does, it's not a person, it's, it's, it's just a pretty face. And, you know, so they look at this in this grand scheme of, Oh man, I I got her. So then I got her, and oh man, I, 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 and it's like it's like a trophy system for them. And this would be a good example of pleasures. Um, so another thing um, would be riches. For a lot of people, riches is all that there is. There's nothing but money. Well, when I was a kid, we were poor, and you know, I guess having money now is going to fix that or something. I don't know. And uh, so they live their whole life for the pursuit of riches. And then when they have it, they're not happy. And if they don't have it, they're not happy. It's, it's, it doesn't produce any happiness. Um, another earthly thing would be our problems. This can be physical problems. It can be, you know, uh, what, whatever's going on with your family or, or, or with, your, with your friends. Those would be problems, right? And we look at our problems, and they have such great weight to us. You know, we look at, like, our, our temporary health, and we see our problems. Ah, this is just too, too much. Ah. But keep in mind that that would be fixing your eyes on the earthly temporary things. That's not setting your, 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 your focus on the things above. Because your body is perishing, whether you die of a disease or not. And um, the problem is passing, obviously. And so the longer we live for, with our focus on, on such a temporary thing, the more discouraged we're going to be. Um, another example would be the rituals or the spells. For, for the Colossian church, it was rituals like observing the Sabbath. But for a lot of people, they try to include their own little religion thing into their christian walk like some from for some people it's like the the new age yoga thing uh for some people it's like uh wiccan and they try to incorporate these spells and stuff for some people they try to incorporate uh, astrology and these kinds of different things to give them hope and all these and it never does it just makes them feel worse and worse and worse and it literally prevents them from growing in christ but it's one of those earthly things that we're looking at setting our minds on earthly things So instead of that, Paul tells us to set our minds on things above. Well, so we can, let me give you a quick quick list here. Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. We have our eyes fixed on Jesus. When we're going through, going through problems without, without ceasing, we're, it seems like everything in life is falling apart. We set our eyes on Christ. We know that he's there. We know that he cares. We know that he's given his new, his new life. Even if we feel like run down tires on the side of the road, uh, he, we know that he is, he's going to meet us when, when we die and we pass from this, from this existence. We know that he's going to meet us there. You know, th this is the, the hope of Jesus. 
we know that he uh, that he loves us so loved us so much that he he died on a cross for us. So whereas we're tempted to say things like God doesn't care, we know that that's not true because of Christ. So we're setting our eyes on Christ. Another thing that, that, that's above the new life to come. Oh, life is nothing but pain and sorrow and misery. Well, I mean, it has that. It does definitely have that. But keep in mind that this is only a very very short prequel to the uh, to the main event. You know, and so we're looking forward to what's coming, the new life, when we won't have physical pain. And uh, that's something that's good. You know, these are all good things. Death is not the end of the, and death is not hopeless. See, sometimes we kind of get off track and we, we start looking at all the things that are bad and we say, oh, man, you know, uh, this is just hopeless. It's a hopeless situation. Yeah, it probably is. But keep in mind that it's not the final note. Like, you can live in a completely hopeless situation in this life and still not be without hope because your hope isn't built on this life. Does that kind of make sense? So uh, another thing is fixing your eyes on things above uh, or, or minds on things above. Another example of that would be uh, holiness, li living living different. I don't go around and, and, and do all those stupid things. You know, I, I've set myself apart uh, to honor and worship God. That takes us to verse 3. For you died... This is when we were saved. We died when we were saved, died to self. And your life is hidden with Christ and God. So we died, Christ died on the cross, and in believing in him, we also died to ourselves. But he was resurrected and he ascended into heaven. So in the same way our hope is in him and our life, the life that we have, the, 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 the resurrection, resurrected body, the life that we're looking forward to, that's hidden with Christ in heaven. Do you see uh, Jesus? Do you see your new life? No, no, I don't. Do you see, you know, all, do, you, do you see those things? Do you see heaven? Once again, no, you don't see any of those things. It's hidden in heaven with Christ. Your new life is assured. It's just not in your hands yet. You know what I mean? I know that when I walk out of this building, there's going to be a parking lot out there. It's assured. There is a parking lot out there. I just am not currently walking on it. That kind of make sense? It's the same thing. We are in a very small building, but there are cracks in the window, and it's letting in light, and we're looking forward to that in great hope. So, if we died, then we aren't living for ourselves. Our earthly passions died. If we, if, if we died in Christ, and that means it's not about what I want, it's not about what makes me happy, it's about Christ. The pastor said something this morning, I wish I could remember what it was. He said something about how it would... It wasn't all about something like it wasn't all about his level of comfort or something like that. And that's how we basically go to things in life. I want to move to this place. I want to do this thing. I want to have this job. I want to do this because that would make me happy. But if you look at that, the foundation of that is me. It's all about me. I want to live in this dream house. It's like we oftentimes look at pictures online of these houses that are just gorgeous. Man, I wouldn't give to, to live there even for a day. Why? I mean, it's falling apart even now. You just can't see it. You're dying, so you're going to go there for, you know, so just so you can say that you did it. Sometimes you're going to have to go through the, through the sewers of life, and that's going to be okay because one moment in heaven, it's not going to matter anymore. All those things that you really missed out on. and Oh, man, I, I wish I could have had the good life. Don't kid yourself. There's no good life in this life. It's, it's coming still. And uh, that's all right. That's all right. It's okay to have a little bit of anticipation. You know, when you were a kid and you looked forward to your birthday, you woke up and it was awesome. But as you, as you got older, there wasn't any pe people to make it special anymore. So you stopped looking forward to it, right? And uh, so, we, oh, man, life is just, uh, but eh, don't worry about it. It'll be like a birthday. But when you were a kid. A birthday when you're a kid. Um, so if my earthly passions have died, I don't do, do things like sleeping around anymore. Right? If my earthly passions have died, if, if I'm not, if I'm if I have died with Christ, then I don't make decisions based off of what's best for me anymore. Okay, so the same as Christ will will be revealed to us, so will our new life. It takes us to the last verse we're looking at tonight. When Christ, who is who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So he's talking about the second coming, Jesus' second coming. When, when Christ appears again, and that stuff happens with the new heavens and new earth, okay, now you will also appear with him in glory. So he's he's hidden away your new life with him. When we see him, we'll, we'll taste of our new life. 
It is an odd thing to say that we are Christians if we do not choose to be holy. And then it takes us to what is holiness? And this is a, a definition I have right here. Being set apart to live by God's standards rather than my own or another's. That's holiness. Holiness is being set apart. You are being set apart for a purpose. That purpose is God. You are being set apart for God's purposes, not for how I want to live my life, not how somebody else thinks I should live life, how God. See, I mean, it's all, it's all about him. So a good example of this would be, well, I think it's okay to sleep with someone you aren't married to, but God says, see that? The whole but God says bit. See, holiness is being, instead of what I think, that would be the first part, what God says. So I'm being set apart for his purposes. So if we as Christians are truly holy, then we have to live as holy. The Bible, for instance, talks at great lengths about how Christians shouldn't be, you know, gossips and, and spreading problems and, 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 and the problem makers and, and uh, how we should be instead peacemakers, how we should be gentle and kind. But, um, you know, a lot of times we don't quite measure up to that. And so one thing we can easily say about holiness is that holiness, holiness is a choice. It's a choice we must make. So, yes, it is true that God sets us aside as holy. God is doing a work. He saves us, absolutely. But we are not passive in the process. He has saved us, and now we have to choose to walk in that. Do you know what I mean? God can save me all I want, but if I keep going back to porn, I'm not living holy. I have to make a decision. So we try and do is we take we take a real big real big stand. God, I'll never do it again, and we make these promises to God, and then we fail again, and we feel like crap. So then we make a bigger, bolder promise, and then we feel like crap again. See, because the problem is we're still trying to do it the same stupid way. If I'm trying to get off porn, I'm not going to do it to my own self will. I'm going to will myself into not looking at porn. It feels great. You're not going to look at something or do something that feels so good and say, I'm just going to will myself to stop. Yeah, that's just not going to work. You have to have accountability. That's the first thing. And you have to remove opportunity. Accountability means that you have other people coming alongside you. Okay? So people who check in with you, people who get computer reports about everything you look at. And then opportunity. So maybe when I'm home alone, not having internet access. See, that, that's going to cost you something. Well, I can't. I can't do that. Well, then you can't succeed. You are holding yourself back because you are convinced that you cannot live without that thing, and you're not making it. And that's how it is. Holiness is a choice you have to make. I was reading, I believe it's Spurgeon who said this. He said, the more I believe that the more holy a, per a person is, the more their sin bothers them. So if you think that you're real holy, and you're saying, man, I really have my act together, nope, you're just arrogant. Spurgeon said, and I totally agree with him, but if you don't know who Charles Spurgeon is, he's a, uh, a preacher. Yeah. Uh, he said that the holier the person becomes, the more their sin bothers them, the more it becomes apparent to them. So when you think, oh, I'm doing so great, I lie on a field of victory, watch out. You're about to make a huge mistake in your life. See, what we do is, I was reading this book by maybe George McDonald. He was talking about the way that everybody says in their mind, it'll never happen to me. Stupid. Stupid. Get that out of your head. It can happen to anybody. Yes, even you. As long as you go to, the, go to sin and say, I am above sin, you will fall to sin. Well, when you go to sin, you see how ugly it is, and then you look to see, oh, it's in me too. It's all over me. Well, now you can see clearly to actually do something about it. If you think that you're going to be sinless, well, you're wrong there too. But you can move in the direction of holiness. So when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So as Christ will be revealed at the second coming, so will our, our life be revealed at the resurrection. So um, let's, let's kind of tie some ideas up here, and we'll kind of just finish off there. The first idea I want to mention is there, this, this view that, that Paul is trying to contradict in, in the city of Colossae is one that is still going on to today. And that's this idea that our spirit is somehow separate from our body. So I, I, I'm listening to that with the spirit, not with the flesh. You hear people say it like that. Or another good example is, you know, my, 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 flesh, my flesh is just not wanting to do it. 
but my spirit is strong in the Lord. It's like, well, no, I get what you're saying. You're trying to quote Paul. And I get what you're trying to say, that there is a battle inside. But to say that there's two separate beings inside of you is where it gets too far. There are not two separate beings inside of either any of us. We are spirit and body together. Together. You're going to have some physical problems that happen because you're a physical being. You're going to have some other problems develop because you're a spiritual being. Sometimes the spirit is going to influence the physical, and sometimes the physical is going to influence the spiritual. For instance, you can be physically tired and feel like you're far away from God spiritually, and then all you needed was a nap and a snack, and you feel fine. Oh, there's God again. But then there's going to be other times when God, you know, kind of pulls back, and no amount of eating or sleeping or anything else is going to do anything about it. So, let's kind of get that out there. We are spirit on and body. What we believe, are, think, feel, inside, outside, it's all one. Spiritual reality and, and physical illusion, no, that's not true. In fact, there was a cult that started, it was called Christian Science, that that was an entire basis of thought, that if I get sick, I can just deny it. Their leader, Mary, ba Mary Baker Eddy, actually died of cancer very painfully and very slowly. She denied it all she could, and it still killed her. See, you don't have to, in order to have faith, you don't have to, like, deny reality. Like, oh, I reject that. You know what I mean? Like, for, here's a great example. I know that God can heal my mom without a new liver. And I want him to, and I pray that he does. But he never promised that he would. See what I mean? I have to be okay with whatever happens in the situation. Now, when I talk about it, I'm going to say things like this. We're looking for a new liver. That doesn't mean that I don't believe that God can heal her liver that she has in her. That, that's, that's not what that means at all. That means, in the physical, the next step is a new liver. Yes, I understand that miracles can happen. I understand that God can inter intervene. But I'm saying our next step is a new liver. Not a lack of faith on my part. I know what God can do. I'm simply saying we need a new liver. Does that kind of make sense? And I think that this is exactly the same kind of thing that we, we go through over and over again. When I first got this diagnosis, you know, people with all these, well, I'll keep praying. And it's like, oh, hold on. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray. But also, let's, let's acknowledge this, that God sustained me through my sickness, that he gave me a medicine that actually works. He got me the help that I needed through a doctor. I mean, let's, let's acknowledge this and be thankful for this. Like, if you want to pray for my healing, that's fine. But let's not overlook the miracle that God has done in me. Because it's not the miracle that I wanted. You know what I mean? That kind of that makes sense. So there's not spirituality than physical illusion. No, this is real too. The physical world is real. If the physical world is just an illusion, then Jesus was just an illusion. And his death means nothing. So we know Jesus was actually here in the flesh. <laughs> he was fully human. That's the whole point that Paul is trying to make. And so we know that, yes, the physical is, is real. Denying is not going to change it. I am physical, physically ill, sometimes because of spiritual things, sometimes not. Okay. So the next thing that we can kind of apply from the book of uh, Colossians, this is a really kind of hard lesson to learn. It's easy to say it's hard to learn. So let me, let me try to say it in a simple way. In your life, you're going to look for high to high, a lot of spiritual good, great things. You're going to look for... You know, I just want more of God, more of all. You want to live on mountaintops, okay? The majority of your life is going to be actually just really ordinary. You're not going to have these, you know, you're not going to see 12,000 people saved in one day. You're not going to pray these prayers of miracles and see people healed every single time. You're not going to go and have like this ministry that saves the entire city. And I mean, yes, God can do those things. But most of your life is going to be ordinary. You know what I mean? It's going to involve you getting up and going to sleep at, at good times, making your bed, brushing your teeth, getting a job. Regular things. Eating. Not even necessarily good food. Sometimes you're just going to eat a meal that you really don't want to eat just to get by. A lot of your life is going to be ordinary. But the more that we submit to godly living, the more that we submit to God's ways, the more we will experience our new life here. You see what I'm saying? Another way of saying that would be the more we obey God here in this life, the more we will experience God's goodness here in this life. We become our own filter like a tap, 
And what happens is we don't want to live our lives for God. We don't want to even focus on God or even do things for God or, or have God as any part of our life. We want our life to just magically work out with no problems. And then, you know, it'll all work out when we're in heaven. That's a miserable way to live. I mean, if God's not a part of your life, you are missing out on so much joy, so much peace. You know what I mean? Those of us who have gone through physical, serious physical difficulties, you know how quickly your your feelings are fleeting. I remember there was one part with with just being so depressed that I was literally just looking on looking for stuff online to find encouragement. I was so depressed at anything that even sounded hopeful. I was even getting and in, getting into things that were just like nonsense. Like, live your truth and all this different nonsense stuff. Because anything that even resembled the memory of hope. You know what I mean? Does that kind of make sense to you? Well, with Christ, you don't have to do that. With Christ, you can seek him, and you can read the Bible, and you can find answers. And he has this way of talking in your innermost being. I don't know exactly how to say that in words, but if you've experienced it, you don't really need me to know. And if you haven't experienced it, the only way that you will know is if you do experience it. So I guess what I'm saying is maybe accept that your life is ordinary and ex submit to him more in your life, and you'll experience it more. Like I say, it's a really hard thing to say, but it's a really easy concept. In your life, live for whoever owns you. And, well, I don't know who owns me. I, maybe, maybe I say that it's Christ, but here's just a real quick, easy way. Where does your money go? Where does your time go? Where do your values come from? When the rubber meets the road, what is the core of your belief that you actually really do believe? In trials, who is it that, you are, who is, it that is blamed first? Who do you get mad at first? Yourself, God, others, etc. This will kind of show you who owns you. A lot of times we, we don't like the ugliness that we see because we want to think that we're the heroes of our own stories. And that's not true. So for the Colossian church, they were looking for all these mystical encounters. This is something that people still do today. I want to see aliens. Or not aliens. I want to see angels, not aliens. I want to see angels. I want to experience these heavenly things and, and all this stuff. And it's interesting that Paul told them they weren't to rely on feelings or experience, but truth in Christ. I mean, look back at what we read and ask yourself this. Did he say seek spiritual things, or did he say, set your minds on things above? Because people who seek spiritual things, they always say, oh, it's, it's, it's beyond this world. It's, you know, heavenly and stuff. It's like, no, 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 it's an experience you're looking for. Like, there's a church in California, it's called Bethel, and they had this one thing where supposedly gold dust was falling out of the vents uh, in, their, in their service, and they took this as a sign from God. Maybe. I mean, maybe. And nobody was getting healed or anything. It was just Gold dust falling out of the vents, which is, by the way, easily faked. You can just climb up there and put some gold dust up there. I, I, don't, I don't need to see things that, that wonder my eyes. I need to see lives changed. I need to see hope. I need to see people healed. You know what I mean? That's the kind of stuff that I think is more of a mark of God than, you know, gold dust falling out of the... That doesn't do anybody any good. People always want to say that they've had an encounter with, with God, but then their life is just the same. What they mean to say is they got a tingle in the back of their... Uh, of their of their spine here, and it made them feel real good. Well, I get that sometimes when I listen to really good music. Like, doesn't mean that it's God. So Paul didn't tell them, "Hey, seek spiritual things." He told them, "Set your minds on things above." See, the the Colossian church was a lot like us, and I think that we could we could summarize everything from from Colossians three one through four with this very simple statement. Think on things above, whatever is good or, or eternal or holy or Christ honored, whatever is Christ like, whatever is pure and true, think on those things. Philippians actually says something very similar to what I just said. It says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence and if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on those things. Think about those things. Don't think about your problems. Don't think about, about you know, uh, all the people who have hurt you and wronged you. Don't think about all this nonsense. Think about these things instead. So I, I guess we could even summarize this a little bit differently by saying uh, even a simpler sentence, challenge your thoughts to see if they're from God. Don't do this just if you think that you're in a bad place in your life. Do it at all times. Because what happens is we allow these little thoughts in that are not great. Not great. And there's a lot of ways you can aware yourself of them. 
talking to other Christians, listening to podcasts, listening to sermons, studying the Bible, praying, taking a thought that frequently pops into your head and stop it and say, no, 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 what does the Bible actually say about this? Well, I'm just, I'm just worthless. I'd be better off dead than alive. Okay, what does the Bible say about that? So take a thought that is constantly popping into your head and see what the Bible says about this. God's not going to give me more than I can handle. What does the Bible say about that? Oh, uh, well, well, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can get through this. I'm strong enough. I, I, I'm a champion. People say that kind of stuff all the time. Are you, though? Does the Bible, does the Bible say that you are? Because I, I, I remember repeatedly throughout the Bible where it says that God is a champion. He's a warrior. And I don't remember a whole lot of times where he tells us to affirm ourselves in ourselves by ourselves. So I hope that this kind of summary helps you understand where Paul is going with the whole ethics. You know, talking, okay, this is, you need to change what you believe so that it affects how you live. So now let's talk about how you're living. And the first thing you guys um, are getting a little bit off on with this is you're not thinking on, on godly things. So because you're not thinking on godly things, the rest of your ethics are messed up. So he went from beliefs to what you're thinking about. So he's going he's gonna to keep on with that progression, and we'll move on that uh, next week.